Thank you, Samus. Well, we've been in this series, a great, powerful series, a series that has taken on so much new life and has imparted to so many here with, with a new calling, with a new vision, with a new heart for the ministry and the gifting that God has given you. And tonight, we're going to dig even deeper into these gifts, and we're going to study, and we're going to understand, and we're going to feel called and led, and we're going to get washed. You know, this series has already addressed hospitality, encouragement, faith, evangelism, discernment, administration, wisdom, giving, knowledge, and there's still more. Last week we talked about teaching, and it's been powerful, and there's, I've watched and I've listened, and I see you getting touched, and I see you getting called, and I see you getting quickened to flow into these gifts that God has given you because your desire is to be fulfilled. Who doesn't want to be fulfilled? Who doesn't want to have a fulfilling relationship with God where you feel like you're being used in the kingdom, where you're being used by God to affect change in a dark world? to be a light, to be a harbinger of light, a a, a minister of light. And these gifts that God gives us are directly from Him. Gifts directly from God. Who could refuse such a gift? Who would want to refuse such a gift as a gift from God? But we have to understand these gifts, and we have to recognize these gifts, and we need to understand what God's Word says about these supernatural spiritual gifts. Now, there's a difference between a talent and a gift, and we talked about this last week. A talent is present from natural birth, but a gift is present from spiritual birth, and it's something new being done in you. Something new that God's doing in you when you come into the kingdom, when you accept Yeshua as the Messiah, you get this invested gift from God. You know, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says the old is gone, the new is come. And with that newness, with that new self, with that new creation comes a new gift. Your talent may still be there, but now your gift, the fullness of that gift that comes directly from God is present. A talent operates through common grace, but a gift operates through supernatural grace. And when you're operating in that supernatural gift, the grace of God flows through you. Even, yes, in administration. Yes, in hospitality. Yes, in teaching. Yes, in all those areas. It's a supernatural grace that flows through you where you become so effective, you're able to be fulfilled. And when you're fulfilled, you are enjoying what God is giving you. And you're a light to others, an encouragement to others. And every gift is for the uplifting and the encouragement of the body. It's not for you. It's to glorify God, the one who gave it to you. It's to encourage the whole body to make sure that every piece part fits together neatly. That God's plan for this kahilat, for this family, for this congregation, for this assembly is according to His design and His plan, not our very own. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 4, there's different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. Now, I like that gift, but that's not my gift. It's not up to me, it's up to the Holy Spirit. It's up to God and His perfect design. In Romans 12, 3 through 8, we continue to read, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Messiah we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. 
We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27 through 31, now you are the body of Messiah, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the congregation, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, and also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Important question, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret but eagerly desire the greater gifts? Tonight we look at the gift of healing, a powerful gift in the body, a fabulous gift of the, of the Ruach HaKodesh, a gift given by God. And what's so amazing about the gift of healing is Yeshua healed unbelievers. They didn't make a profession of faith in Him as the Messiah first. They made a profession of faith in believing that He could do it, and He did it. And then they committed their life. For many, that was the first step of faith, is believing that He could. It was for the edification of uplifting the kingdom of God. It was a witness to those who did not believe that those could see it. The testimony of someone who's been supernaturally healed is irrefutable because guess who's the one that testifies to it and confirms it? The doctors. I was there on Thursday. They showed me a, a, a mass on my lung, a, 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 an x-ray. I went and I got prayer. And I came back and they said, huh, must have been a mistake with the x-ray machine. We don't see it there anymore. Or someone gets healed in the pew, waiting for prayer. Or how is it that you can come up here and say, Rabbi, will you pray for my Uncle Louie? Uncle Louie's sick. He's in St. Louis and he's got cancer. How can I pray for him here and a thousand miles away from here? He gets healed. If it has to be a ministry where I can only lay my hands on somebody. Does this gift transcend time and space? Is it so powerful and so profound a gift that it's available to the body? You put your prayers in this wall. Does the wall have power? No. Lord, heal my mother. Lord, heal my child. Lord, heal the friend of a friend. And you put that prayer on the wall and supernaturally gets healed. Who's got the gift of healing? The power of the prayer. It's the power of the faith behind the prayer that fuels the prayer. God will use the body, the body of Messiah for the gift of healing. Why do we have profound healings here? Is it because healing is my gift? I will tell you it's not. It's the collective gift of this congregation. It's a collective faith in the power of this faith. Imagine, if you will, if your car with it has 180 horsepower, if you had to hook up 180 individual horses and try to get them to run together. Wouldn't happen, would it? But the car manufacturer harnessed it and put it in one engine, and that engine works together and has the power of 180 horses. And that's that healing power that comes into a congregation and ministers through you through faith. And that supernatural gift of healing manifests itself in the body. Now, there are people with the gift of healing, and they operate in the congregation. This isn't a gift that some person has to edify the person. It edifies God, and it edifies the body of Messiah. It's not for someone's gain. And when you look at the ministries in the Bible, is healing a ministry? It's a gift. Now, people with this gift of healing pray with and care for those who are ill or distressed. They have a calling to go out and to make calls and to minister to people who are sick. 
Those that went to pray for the lepers had no concern for themselves. Why? Because they were covered with prayer. Those who go into the AIDS wars don't concern themselves with bodily fluids and getting infected with AIDS because they're there to minister. They're felt, they, they have this calling to go into the most difficult situations to minister. What might be disgusting and, and fearful for you and I is not disgusting and fearful for them because they want to avail themselves of the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to lay hands on somebody, to be there to minister to them when no one else will go. People who have the gift of healing have a deep sense of compassion and want God to bring about restoration to the sick and the diseased. People with the gift of healing authenticate a message from God through healing. How much more powerful is someone's testimony when they tell you they were on the brink of death and they had a visitation in the hospital? And while they were laying there in their hospital bed, God revealed something so profound to them that when they saw it, they were healed, and they came out of the hospital with a testimony on their lips. How could that happen? No one recovers from that illness in 24 hours. No one in the history of mankind, of modern science, has ever recovered from that in 24 hours. Why you? Oh, because Yeshua visited me in the hospital. I had a visitation from Yeshua in the hospital. He laid his hands on me, and now I can testify to the power of God. Not the power of doctors, not the power of man, but the power of God. The gift of healing only edifies and glorifies God. Not the person. If you see uh, Eric Walker Ministries, Healing Ministries, come get your hands laid on and pay me homage. Snake handling. Nothing more than snake handling. Why do we have profound healings here at Bethel? Because of you, not because of me. Because the power of the faith collectively and the anointing, the anointing that breaks every yoke. People with this gift use this as an opportunity to communicate a biblical truth to see God glorified, not themselves. First time I ever was asked to pray for somebody was in the parking lot of Bethel in Roswell, Georgia. I wasn't that season a believer, and a man named Michael Korn came up to me and said, I can't hear. You remember that? Okay. He said, I want you to lay your hands on me and pray for me. I said, I, 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 I don't know how to do this. He said, Eric, just take your hand and put it over my ear and pray that God would heal my ear. And I said, okay, Lord, heal his ear. He said, I can hear. <laughs> Freaked me out. Freaked me out, standing under a light by a trash can in a parking lot. Oh, you mean it wasn't an anointed place and there wasn't praise and worship music and there wasn't this altar call and all this stuff and, and, you, and you pulled out your anointing oil and you, right? No, I just stood there in the parking lot. I took my hand out of my pocket. Out of that anointed place of the pocket. <laughs> and I pulled out some of that lint anointing, that supernatural lint anointing, and put it up on his ear. I didn't know what to think of it, and guess what? I didn't. I didn't think of it. Glory to God. Michael Korn could hear, give him a call, Facebook him, ask him about that night. It wasn't the beginning of a ministry. It wasn't the beginning of a supernatural calling. It was someone that believed that the prayers of a righteous man availed much. He felt I was a righteous man. Put your hand on my ear. I don't care that you know how to do it or you don't know how to do it. And there's no magic words or incantation. You believe along with me that if you put your hand on my ear and say, hear, I'll be able to hear. So, okay. Because I didn't know enough not to stand there and put my hand on his ear and say, hear. And he heard. And now when he tells that story that he heard, who is he testifying about? I can guarantee you when he gives that testimony, he doesn't mention my name. Because it's not about me. And this is the first time in what, 12 years, 10, 12 years, I mentioned his name in telling this story. Because it's not about him and it's not about me, it's about the Lord. 
Now, people with this gift of healing, with this calling, pray, touch, or just speak words that miraculously, miraculously bring healing to one's body. God never heals in order to give a man honor or fame. Let me repeat that. God never heals to give a man honor or fame. He doesn't do it to glorify the man. He doesn't do it to glorify the ministry. He doesn't do it to glorify the congregation. He does it to glorify himself. Healing is not a spectacle or something for show. We must never make a big show out of healing in our congregations. We can't do it. We announce a healing service here at Bethel El about, on average, and once a quarter. If you had any idea what goes into that, if you had any idea how much prayer and fasting goes into it, it's a lot of work. Well, if you have the gift of healing, it is no work. You walk up into a parking lot under a street lamp, and you put your hand on somebody's ear, and you say, here, and they hear. It's not a lot of work, but for me, it's a lot of work. And to build up to it in the expectation, the faith, and the prayer, because when you come in here, you come in expecting something to happen. Well, what is expectancy? Expectancy is faith. And your faith is built up, and your faith is shored up, and your faith in God is lifted up, and you come here, and you bring your friends, and you bring your family, and you bring them here and say, hey, come get a touch from who? From the rabbi? No. Come get a touch from the Lord. Come get a touch from the Lord, because that's what healing is all about, a touch from the Lord. Healing happens within the context of the body in the faithful congregation. Not the fearful, not the sick, but the faithful congregation. Healing takes place. The Lord may use anybody in the congregation, not just me, not just Miss Laura, anybody. Yes, you and you and you and you and you and you and the little kids, anybody. doesn't have to be somebody that has an ordination or a diploma or a document on the wall. God can perform a healing while someone's playing the piano or while I'm preaching or teaching or while I pray with my hand outstretched over a sick person's head, or walking by, or you walking by, or you speaking a word of kindness into somebody, and they get healed. Or you breathe on them, a simple breath of God, and that power and that anointing will heal them. Sometimes... We pray and the Lord heals a person hundreds of miles away. How does that happen? How does that happen if you have to have this formula? Oh, well, you have to come forward and you have to ask the elders to lay their hands on you and they must anoint you in with your head with oil and they must do it in a particular way and you have to kneel on one knee. No, not that knee. It's got to be that knee. And you have to cock your head like this and lift it up and believe. No, how can that be when we put that prayer in the wall and Uncle Louis in St. Louis is healed? How can it be that there's some pattern for me? Yes, if you're in the congregation and you're sick, yes, come forward and ask us to lay hands on you and pray for you. Who is that for? Is that for me? Is that for you? The person we're praying for, is it for you who bear witness to the fact that the person has a healing? Why do we ask every Saturday for testimonies and every Tuesday night for testimonies? What's God done for you lately? Because we're overcomer by the word of our testimony in the blood of the Lamb. Healing is not to promote anyone. We must never elevate any man or give attention to anyone but the Lord. Many people use this gift for personal promotion. It's very common. They use the gift to promote themselves. They also focus on it to the exclusion of the other gifts. Yet there are nine or 14 spiritual gifts, depending on who's counting. And God intended it to function together as a unit. It's not just one or two gifts. You know, in a congregation, you have to have that gift of administration. You have to have that gift of hospitality. You have to have the gift of teaching. You have to have that gift of knowledge and a word of knowledge. You have to have all those things operating in, for the, in order for the body to operate in unity. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Why is unity so important? Because when we operate in unity, we're healthy. 
Well, what happens when we're sick? It's an immune system. The body, what, becomes weak in a particular area, and it's not working in unity, and one has to take over the other, and we begin to fight these things. And don't we talk about fighting infection, right? And a part of a body has to use its energy to fight infection, and it moves over here, and it moves over there, and pretty soon one part of us is compromised, and we're not working in perfect harmony. And if we're not working in perfect harmony, what is it? We're sick. We've got something wrong with us. And when we're feeling great, what's happening? We're operating as a unit. The whole body is operating together. Well, it's no different. God shows us in the natural what goes on in the supernatural. And if the congregation isn't operating in all the gifts, then the gift of healing isn't as powerful and it's not as prevalent. It's not as present as it is when all the gifts are operating together. A congregation emphasizing just one or two gifts like healing and miracles or tongues and prophecy will have imbalance in the congregation. And we've seen that in congregations that emphasize just speaking in tongues, and that's the focus of the ministry. Yet they're lacking in other areas, and oh, God will allow it, but God doesn't bless it. And you don't see the favor and the supernatural doors and the, and the walls being broken down in that ministry because they're not operating fully firing on all cylinders. Oh, you can go from here to, oh, let's say Rochester, Minnesota, in an eight-cylinder car and only operate on four cylinders. Oh, you'll get there. You'll still get there, but it won't be as efficient. And your gas mileage won't be as good, and the car won't be operating right when it gets there. You can still get there, though, so you can still accomplish what you're trying to set out to do, but will you get there efficiently? Will you get there with God's blessing? You won't. And that's what happens when a congregation operates on some of the gifts as opposed to all of the gifts. And we need to understand this because you who are in this congregation, they're called to this gift or that gift. Yes, you are just as important. Be jealous for no man's gift. Be jealous for no man's gift. Flow in the gift God gives you because your fulfillment in the body of Messiah will be that because you're doing your part, they can do their part. And when they're doing their part, this one can do their part. And then things and walls begin breaking down and people start getting healed and supernatural provision and you go to the mailbox and you were thinking, how am I going to make ends meet? And you open up the mailbox and there's a check. Why? Because the whole congregation is operating and the prayers are effective. And the prayers are effective because the whole body is fitted together neatly the way God ordained it. And I'm not jealous for your gift, and you're not jealous for that person's gift. And you're operating fully on all eight cylinders. And all 150 horses are running together. And instead of acting like 150 or 250 or 500 individual light bulbs, you're operating as one 500 candle power bulb, and you're bright, and you're bold, and people are drawn to it. And that's when you're operating in your gifts in unity. Some professional ministers, unfortunately, claim to have all the gifts of the Spirit, but that's not true. The Bible is perfectly clear that no person in the congregation has them all. But here's the great news. Here's the great news. Nobody has them all, but everybody has at least one. And that's great news, and that's encouraging because that means there's something for everybody in the body of Messiah. There's something for everybody to operate in the congregation. There's some contribution that every one of you can make in some special way from God. Instead, we know that the Holy Spirit gives the gifts to the whole body, the faithful congregation, spreading them around, spreading them around the way the Holy Spirit sees fit. A spiritual gift is miraculous. It's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. How do you think this congregation would operate if the gift of administration wasn't active and effective? The lights wouldn't go on. The AC wouldn't come on. The doors wouldn't open. The bills wouldn't get paid. The papers wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have visitor packages. We wouldn't have sedours. We wouldn't have lights. We wouldn't have sound. We wouldn't have anything. And oh, by the way, I wouldn't have a message. I wouldn't be prepared. Because administration requires time management and effective time management. And so if one part of it falls down and you don't pay the water bill, that coffee bar out there is pretty meaningless, isn't it? There's no water to make the coffee. Oh, it looks nice, just not effective. Physicians may help cure people, and this is a wonderful skill, but not a spiritual gift. A spiritual gift is something we cannot explain by natural means. 
It's interesting that the first three gifts listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 are in the singular. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the gift of faith. Isn't it interesting that healing is called the gifts of healing? The gifts of healing, the plural gifts of healing. The reason it's plural is that healing can happen in so many ways. Sometimes the healing occurs during the opening prayer. You came in, you were feeling bad, and all of a sudden we open the prayer. We welcome the Holy Spirit and you feel a washing and a refreshing, and no longer do you feel bad because your prayers healed you. Sometimes we're sick just because our thinking is sick. And getting on board with a prayer life, this may be the only time you prayed today. And all of a sudden you feel refreshed. And a light bulb should go off that prayer healed you. Sometimes healing happens during the songs. We've seen dramatic healing occur in the middle of the message. Or, of course, during the time of individual prayer during our healing service. And some of our most profound healings have occurred right there in the pews while waiting for the altar to be open. God can heal a person at any point during the service. Now, some believers misunderstand healing and think it depends on certain circumstances or method like touching the person's forehead or shouting for the sickness to leave the body. The healing does not depend on rituals or material things. Remember how Naaman needed a healing from leprosy and he became angry that the prophet did not stand over him, waving his hand, saying special prayers. Remember, that was his expectation. Isn't that the expectation so many people have, that you have to wave your hands and you have to say these special prayers and all this? In 2 Kings 5, 8 through 14, we read, When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message, Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. This is the expectation we have. We have to have this special thing take place. Are not Arbana and far, far the rivers of Damascus better than any of the waters of Israel? Could not wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage, but Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you have not done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy, because he was obedient to do what he said. To set aside his expectation as to how it should be done. How many of us get so distracted with the how it should be done? And we have an expectation, oh, the rabbi didn't do this. Or this person didn't pray the way they were supposed to pray. Because we have this expectation of how it's supposed to be done. But the truth of the matter is, it's not in the process, it's in the faith. It's not in the process and in the methodology, it's in the Word of God being applied. He could not receive a healing until he obeyed the prophet's instructions. People still think like this today. They think that their healing must happen just like other circumstances, instances of healing they've seen. Yet the truth is God heals in many ways. Paul mentions this gift in the plural as the gifts of healing. To whom does God give the healing? Does God, does God give the gift of healing just to me? Should we say that God gives the gift of healing to the person being healed? Neither of these is completely correct. The Spirit gives the spiritual gifts to the faithful, the body as a whole. You see, these gifts are available to the body, to the faithful body, to those who believe in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, for those that have a relationship with God, for those who have accepted Messiah. The manifestation of the gift may come through a member or me, and indeed some receive physical healing. The purpose, however, is to edify the whole congregation. Not merely to restore one person to health. It's not a selfish gift. It's a corporate one. It's a corporate gift to edify the body of Messiah, to bring about and to effect change in the body. He performs healings to encourage the entire congregation to be more obedient and faithful after they learn of a healing and to understand a little bit more about how God works. And what God is like. God does not need to show off or prove himself to us. 
He wants to build up the congregation through each healing. And that's true with every spiritual gift. He wants to build up the congregation through every gift being active in the congregation, not one gift being more important than another gift. We must keep our priorities in place in regards to healing. Luke 17, 11 through 19 says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Yeshua traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And he was going into a village. Ten men who had leprosy met him. And they stood at a distance, a distance and called out in a loud voice, Yeshua, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Go show yourself to the priest, and as they went, they were cleansed. You mean no, no words of, oh, you're healed, or your sins are forgiven, or let me do this, or let me do this. He just said, go show yourself to the priest. That was all the words he said, and they were cleansed. But one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Yeshua's feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Yeshua asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to them, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. It's all about our attitude. It's all about our faith. It's all about our priorities and making sure that we're doing the right thing as a body. And making sure we're embracing all of these gifts, including the gift of healing. When we all leave these physical bodies behind, we go to heaven. Any healing, therefore, is just a temporary fix. God's more concerned with where our souls will spend eternity. What does it profit a man if he receives a complete healing, but his soul dies and does not reach heaven? We read about if your hand causes you to sin, cut your hand off. It's better to go into the kingdom of heaven with just one hand than it is with a whole body to go into the pit of hell. And God's more concerned not with our temporary healing, but with our permanent healing. God's more concerned that the gift of healing be eternal and not temporal. That the gift of healing be active in you and in this body. That you might know that God's more concerned with your spiritual healing than your physical healing. But He knows that through your physical healing, your spiritual life will grow. That others who did not believe might come into faith because they see the miracle of a healing. That others who receive this gift, if used properly, and turn away from the life they had and they turn their lives toward God and glorify Him for the healing that He gave them on earth, then, then God is glorified. I started this out by saying many who received their healing like that leper weren't believers. They cried out, Lord, help us, but not knowing what he could do. And he didn't speak those magical words, Oh, in the name of God, I lay my hands upon you, and I anoint you with oil. And I speak to this, and I speak to that, and I do this, and I do that. He just said, Go show yourself to the priest. And they were cleansed. Only one took notice and gave thanks. Ten were healed. Who will you be? You who are here tonight, who have breath, have been healed for another day. To live another day. I opened the paper this morning and there was a whole list of people in alphabetical order that didn't live to see today. And therefore, you've had your healing. You're here to live and tell about it. But will you turn to the Lord like the one and say, thank you? Or will you forget and be like the nine and take your life for granted and the gift of life and the gift of breath for granted? Or you'd be more concerned about the aches and pains or the diagnosis or what's going on in your life and the circumstances and the difficulties and not recognize that your healing has come. Not recognize that God spared you. Spared you, yes, you. Everyone here tonight has been spared. And will you say thank you? And what about you that have never said yes to the Messiah? 
Will you receive your healing tonight? Will you receive your gift tonight? Will you allow God to wash you clean of all your iniquity? To take that heart of stone from you and replace it with a heart of flesh and give you a new life. And with that new life to give you new gifts. Why has he sustained you for today if not to give you your healing? Why has he allowed you to see another day if not to receive your eternal healing? If you're here tonight and you've never said yes to Yeshua, yes to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity because I'm more concerned about your eternal life than I am your temporal one. I'm more concerned right now with where you'll spend eternity than where you'll receive treatment for your illness. If you've never said yes to Jesus, I want you to say this simple prayer. Lord, I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. And I believe that Jesus, Yeshua, died for my sins. And I ask him to come into my heart. And I believe that he died for me and that on the third day he rose again and now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for me. And because he lives, I can live now and forevermore. Hard words for some to say. Hard words for those to think that they gave themselves breath and that they lived another day on their own. No man has ever birthed himself. No man can give himself the next breath. Every gift we get, every breath we get is from God. If you're here tonight and you've never said yes, the one who made you to God's plan of atonement, God's plan of salvation, God's plan of restoration, God's plan of healing for your soul. Just slip up your hand and I'll say that prayer with you. Is there anybody here tonight who would like to say that prayer for the first time? Is there anybody? Is there anybody? Let's stand to our feet. The gift of healing is active in this place. And if you need healing, physical, emotional, spiritual healing, I want you to come forward right now. I want you to come up right now. The altar is open for healing, for supernatural healing. You come forward, receive healing. I'm going to speak healing tonight. Physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing. Healing from fear, healing from depression, healing from anxiety, healing from sadness, healing from despair, healing from cancer, from glaucoma, from blindness, from deafness, healing from emphysema, from COPD, healing from addiction, healing from pornography, healing from drugs, healing from sexual addiction, healing from abuse, healing from trauma. I'm speaking to you and 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 to every one of your ailments and every one of your illnesses. A spirit of lack, a spirit of Jezebel, leave now in the name of Yeshua. Receive your healing. Let that healing wash over you. Supernaturally wash over you. Supernaturally wash over you. Psalmist, turn it up. Turn it up. Turn it up. Violin, turn it up. Flute, turn it up. Bring it. Break up that atmosphere. Break up that atmosphere. Break up that atmosphere. We speak to the enemy. You have no place in the lives of these people. We take authority right now over cancer, leukemia, MS, muscular dystrophy, autism, Asperger's, cancer, lupus. Leave now in the name of Yeshua. We plead the blood of Messiah over you right now. We wash you clean. Not with the anointing oil. Not with supernatural prayers. But with the command of the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit as it washes you clean. Receive that healing. Bind that strong man. Bind that thought life. Command power and authority. Command the Holy Spirit to wash through you now as you receive healing. Receive that healing. 
Allow God to minister to you and through you. Reach out and put your hand on someone and tell them, you are healed. Claim your healing. Say, I am healed. I receive my healing. I take authority over my, my infirmity. Leave now in the name of Yeshua. Leave now in the name of Yeshua. Leave now in the name of Yeshua. I command you to leave now in the name of Yeshua. Receive that healing. Receive that healing. Receive that healing. Receive that healing. God's restoring bodies. He's restoring minds. He's restoring joints, ligaments, tendons, cartilage. Cancer leave. Cancer leave. Cancer leave now in the name of Yeshua. Leave now. Shoulders be healed. Hips be healed. Sciatica leave now in the name of Yeshua. We command you. We take authority over you. And every assignment from the enemy, we plead the blood of a Messiah over you and about you. A washing through. God says he'll give you a new heart. He'll give you a new body. He'll restore you. He'll refresh you for the edification of the body. For the edification of the body. There's a word tonight in this congregation. Bring that word forward. Bring that word forward. Hallelujah. I confirm that word. Luke 10 and 19, I've given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing, nothing whatsoever can harm you. Nothing whatsoever can harm you. I take that authority right now in the name of Yeshua. I take that authority right now. Take that authority right now. Take that authority. Put them under your feet. Under your feet. Under your feet. Blot him from your life. Take authority right now and blot him from your life. Stop him. Put him under your feet. Put him under your feet, enemy. You're under our feet. You have no authority here. Not over this congregation. Not over our bodies. Not over our emotions. Not over our finances. Leave now in the name of Yeshua. Leave now in the name of Yeshua. Hallelujah. 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 Roger Beatty, where are you? Come up here. Do the Kiddush and the Hamotzi. Take authority. Seal it with the blood of Messiah. Seal it with the body of Messiah. As we drink from the fruit of the vine, Yeshua said, I am the vine. I am the true vine. Amen. Blessed art thou, Lord of God, King of the universe, that creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. Yeshua said, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of this bread will never go hungry. In Numbers chapter 6 and verse 22, the Lord said to Moses, this is the way you are to bless the children of Israel. In this way I will put my name on them and I will